So yeah, thanks again for logging on. Um, I'm incredibly passionate about these owls, which will hopefully come across in this presentation and in birds more general. Um, um, so I'm a PhD candidate at Deakin University. So I'm a year and a half, or just over halfway through my PhD at Deakin. Um, and I'm working with the team of Raylene Cook and John White as my supervisors. Um, I've been watching Powerful Owls um, since about 2013 and um, documenting different local pairs in their breeding. Um, and in 2016, I started an honours project with um, Ray and John at Deakin. And that's where this current line of research started, um, investigating their spatial ecology of the powerful owl. Um, and yeah, now I'm doing a PhD, so I've returned back to Deakin. Um, as we go through my presentation, I'm going to be sharing um, some different uh, resources for you to Go, go and do some further reading and research. So um, unfortunately, I can't talk for three hours about powerful owls this morning. So um, I'll be giving you some resources. So if you've got a pen and paper there, um, you can jot down some of the, the titles of those um, articles and research publications. Most of them are open access, so you can go and um, have a, have a read about them in your own time. Um, so in terms of the format of my presentation this morning, um, I just wanted to start my presentation with the bigger picture, putting our research in context to global ecological issues. And then we'll move into the ecology, which I'm sure most of you are very interested in learning about. And then we'll shift into the research that has happened in recent years and then how you can help the owls and we'll shift into questions later on. So um, just to start off with, there's two major issues to biodiversity currently. Um, so we have a global decline in apex predators um, and apex predators are critically important for maintaining um, biodiverse ecosystems. They can suppress uh, more abundant trophic levels. So when animals become overpopulated, apex predators can help to control those numbers. And I've got the example there of the grey wolves in Yellowstone National Park. And on the right hand side there, at the same time, we also have urbanisation occurring with our increasing human population. And um, this is, so urbanisation is further encroaching onto natural areas and converting them. So there's habitat loss, habitat degradation happening and fragmentation. Um, and so these two things that are occurring at the same time are also interrelated because apex predators have these very or they can have these very specific resource requirements that are generally not found in urban environments. However, there are some apex predators that do survive uh, and thrive in urban environments. And I've got a few examples up here um, from uh, wildlife outside of Australia. So it's really important that we get an understanding of what these species are using in urban environments so that with urban expansion, we can protect those areas and ensure that they can persist um, into the future. So another um, urban apex predator is the powerful owl and it's been subject to research at Deakin University for um, 25 years now with Raylene Cook starting her PhD in 90, uh, research in 95. So uh, this image here I put together early last year 
Um, it, it's called Unscience and Animal. And if you log on to Twitter or Instagram and you search up that hashtag Unscience and Animal, researchers all around the world have um, labelled their study species according to the internet. So if there's any kids out there, you might um, hopefully find this a bit funny. Um, the main thing I wanted to get across here is that the, the owls are very large, so they're 65 centimetres tall, um, and they have these incredible talons and a very hooked beak. Um, they're also very quiet as well when they fly. So they've got these, got some feathers here. They've got um, these uh, edges on, on the ends of their feathers, which enables them to uh, fly completely silently. And the powerful owl is found right across um, from Queensland through to Victoria, not found in Tasmania. Um, pretty much east of the Great Dividing Range, that's where they are found. And they are found in, in the urban centres of um, Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne. So this is an image here um, outside of the Readings Bookshop in Carlton. And there was a powerful owl that was uh, roosting in this uh, uh, tree outside of the Readings Bookshop. Um, so they are found in the CBD um, itself and on the right hand side we have um, an owl, it might be a bit hard to see for you, but it's up here in the tree and it's looking at itself in the reflection of the office building. Um, so it could have been um, seeking company by its reflection in the window there. And I also just wanted to touch on a couple of other common nocturnal birds in Melbourne. So we've got the powerful owl on the left. Um, another common owl is the southern boobook. And so if you picture the powerful owl as being roughly the size of two 30 centimetre rulers together, the powerful owl and the tawny frogmouth um, uh, roughly about the size of a 30 centimetre ruler from, from head to tail. So they're much smaller. Um, the tawny frog mouth is much smaller as well. Um, up in the northern states, tawny frog mouths can get a little bit larger in body size. So in the southern states, they're generally around that 30 centimetre mark. So the powerful owls have these enormous massive talons. Um, Powerful owls can weigh up to two kilos and they are capable of carrying their own body weight and, and over their own body weight in prey. Um, so they really need very strong talons and uh, wings to be able to carry that amount of weight. The, the two um, Ninox species, so the powerful owl and the southern boobook, are, are what are called um, hawk owls and they have these um, talons and the sharp hooked beak as well. Um, the tawny frogmouth is not actually an owl. Um, they're part of the nightjar family. And they are very, very common. So I get a lot of people sending in um, photos of what they think might be a powerful owl, but um, on viewing the photo, it'll be a, a tawny frogmouth. So these are the these are the birds that sit in the tree and try and camouflage. So this was a photo I took um, in in our backyard, and it's trying to blend into the to the branch there. They've got a much wider beak, um, and they've also got very um, kind of finger like. Uh, feet. So they will eat different things compared to these two other owls. Um, they'll eat things like frogs, mice, insects. Um, they don't really have uh, talons for capturing live prey. They'll, they'll eat things whole. So um, here I wanted to touch on the differences between males and females, they can be very difficult to tell apart, especially if you just see one in the tree. Um, however, I was part of some research last year into this year that 
um, had a look at um, analysing some of my photos. So most of these photos that you see on this presentation I've taken myself of owls around Yarra Ranges and Melbourne and that sort of thing. Um, and we worked out that there's a way that you can tell them apart by using a photo. And if, you, if you're able to get the photo with the owl looking square at the camera, like these two here, then you can look at the eye mask. And if the eye mask um, ends, there's a bit of the head feathers and then the edge of the head. That means it's a male. Whereas um, with the female on the uh, right hand side of this image, her face mask feathers extend out past the edge of her head. So if you'd like to read more about this, um, you can download this uh, publication with um, uh, some more information in there. Um, the males are larger in body size, so they can weigh up to two kilos. The females are around 12 to 1300. Um, yep, two kilos, 1.3 kilos. And uh, here's what they sound like. So hopefully this will come through from your end. <coughs> So that's the male, it's a much deeper call. And you might have heard that if you do live in the Yarra Ranges, up around the Dandenongs and things like that, this, this territorial call can travel for a very long way, especially if they're um, sitting really up quite high in a tree. In, and if there's lots of gullies and rivers, then the sound will just travel. So you might've heard that one before. This is the female. <coughs> so it's a higher pitch. Um, the differences are very subtle. Uh, so it does take a, a while to get your to get your ear in to try and pick the differences. Um, and now the, the chicks over here on the, the right hand side and they, they look very different to the adults. They've got that really prominent face mask um, and they do this really cute thing where they, they turn their head upside down. I've got videos of them almost doing headstands um, on my Instagram and things like that. And they do this because they, um, owl's eyes are fixed in their sockets. So to focus on something, they have to move their head and they do this uh, kind of head bobbing action. And they, they seem to be able to um, learn how to focus distance um, better when they're an adult, they don't need to do as much of the head bobbing. But when, the, when, they're, when they are chicks, um, they do it quite a lot. So this is the chick call. It's a very, very different call. And that's the, that's the begging call. So that's what um, you might hear at night if um, owls are nesting near you. Uh, they might, um, you might hear these chick calls and they are very loud. Um, Typically in southern states, you'll hear this call around September, October when the chicks fledge from the hollow. Um, and when they're about this size, they, they can really belt out that begging call, um, pleading for more food. Okay, so powerful owls, they, they'll need three different things it, to survive in urban environments. Um, they need prey. Um, and typically they'll eat 250 to 300 possums in one year. Um, and so in uh, Melbourne, that's usually common ringtail and common brushtail possums. And we'd be, uh, there's a good chance that these owls are surviving just off um, possums alone. Um, there's been a lot of research that's looked into the diet, so I won't um, really go into that too much. There's lots of information online about that. Um, 
But when you when you read 250 to 300 possums, it does sound like a lot, but there is a, a, a significant overpopulation of possums in Melbourne. And I've had councils contact me saying that possum over herbivory is causing dieback of some of the eucalypt trees in certain areas. So by um, encouraging powerful owls to move through to more suburban areas, we can help to control um, some of those numbers. Um, they also need somewhere to roost, which I'll touch on a little bit later in my presentation, and they need a, a large nesting hollow as well. Um, so they are winter nesters, so uh, they should be nesting. So if they're a breeding pair, they should be in the hollow, um, sitting on eggs or chicks at this time of the year. And then, as I said, they will usually fledge a kind of late September, October, the chicks from the hollow. Um, I'm gonna talk about hollows a little bit later on, but it hasn't really been part of my research, so I won't spend too much time um, about the hollows. But it is, um, it is one of the uh, a major threat towards um, the powerful owl because these beautiful um, big old trees, they need to be upwards of two or 300 years old before they can support a hollow large enough to um, have uh, an adult, adult powerful owl female and one or two chicks. So typically it depends on the pair, but they, um, they will have one or two chicks a year if they're a uh, consistent breeding pair. Um, yet these sorts of trees are, are taken out of our landscape because they, they can um, prove a risk to human safety or, or infrastructure. Um, so I guess urbanisation, uh, so despite these owls living in urban environments, urbanisation is an impact of the powerful owl and some of these associated impacts of urbanisation as well. So with um, uh, further urbanisation happening, we're having habitat loss and degradation, and uh, there's going to be more people and more cars on the road. So we're seeing more power flowers hit by cars in, in recent years. And there's been some research out of um, BirdLife Australia, the power flower project in Sydney, which has documented some of the, the major threats towards power flowers. So they are um, threatened as well under the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act of Victoria. Um, they're not listed under Australian legislation federally, um, but we might be working towards um, getting that to happen. And um, they are an apex predator, so generally they sit at the top of the food chain, so nothing will predate on the powerful owls. But when they're a chick at this stage and they uh, when they fledge and they're building those muscles up in their wings, they can be very clumsy. And if they don't have a good, um, if they don't have a good understory vegetation to um, fall down onto, if they can't make it to the next branch, then they can find themselves on the ground, and they can be um, attacked and, and killed by um, cats and, and foxes. So um, please, everyone, I'm hoping that Logged On should be responsible cat owners. You really shouldn't be having your cats outside. Um, and you might tell me that, oh, Mr. Fluffy wouldn't hurt a flea but, uh, or a fly. But um, yeah, they, they really, it is in their instinct to kill um, native wildlife. Okay, so that brings us to, um, so that's uh, all of what we do know about the powerful owl. They are Australia's most studied owl species. And um, so there's many aspects that we, we don't know about. So, and we haven't been able to research uh, on until recently. So we haven't had the technology available to be able to research um, uh, 
the spatial requirements of powerful owls. And so I'm going to be touching on these three points here um, in my presentation. And the reason why we haven't been able to do this until recently is these birds are extremely difficult to catch. Um, they're very elusive, they're, they're nocturnal. Um, you, you basically need the stars to align to catch one. And then you need the right technology to be able to survey where they are going. And um, in, the, in the past, traditional um, movement ecology of, of a species, you'd be using what is called VHF or very high frequency radio tracking. So that's where you might have seen it on TV or you, you might have done it yourself where you go out with, a, with an antenna and you have a receiver and you listen for the beep. And the louder the beep is the direction of where the, uh, where the animal is and you follow that um, signal. Now, doing that sort of tracking in urban environments is extremely difficult because, because of the high amount of privately owned land. Um, so we've been able to use um, GPS loggers for this. So I'll get to the GPS loggers. These are the 10 challenging steps to catching and tracking um, powerful owls. So our, our team, we spend a lot of time, um, a significant amount of our time is spent looking for signs of, of owls. Um, we look for their poo, so we call that whitewash. Um, and where they roost can be, they can routinely use the same roost over and over again. So typically you'll find this sort of evidence um, under a well-used roost. So they're, they're whitewash. Um, I've got some better pictures of these later on. These are called pellets and these are essentially like fur balls. Um, they cough up what they can't digest. So bones, feathers, um, fur, exoskeletons of insects as well. And you can pull these pellets apart and have a look at what they've been eating. Um, we can also look for feathers as well. And um, feathers are a really good sign that it is a powerful owl because they've got distinct feathers, distinctive feathers. Um, if we do find uh, the roosting owl, then um, we can set up a net nearby. And it's, it's, it's a very large net. It's kind of like a mist net, but it doesn't have the pockets. And um, it's strung up between two trees. It's about 10 by 12 meters, uh, 10 by 12. And we use um, call playback. So those calls that you heard before, they're our typical three that we use. And um, we encourage the owl that's nearby to fly to our direction and we encourage flight to intersect with the net um, by using megaphones and call playback. So we really try and minimise the amount of playback that we use. Um, generally, if we haven't had interest by the owl within half an hour to an hour, we, we kind of know that's it, they're not interested. Um, and we'll just pack up. But if the owl does come in, um, and essentially if we have the stars align and we catch the owl, we lower the net um, carefully but quickly, and someone runs in and grabs the owl. Um, we put a beanie over its head to calm it, and they do become surprisingly calm um, when that beanie does go on. We carefully take it out of the net, um, and obviously being very careful where the, where the pointy bits are. We take a weight measurement to determine if, if male or female, with the males being heavier. And then we attach these um, GPS loggers. So we've used um, two over the several years, uh, the four years the project has been running. Um, we've got this um, type of tracker here, which is what we've been using recently. Um, it's very small, very lightweight. This is the older style of tracker that we've been using, um, we have used. 
Um, this one is remotely downloadable, so we can download it from a distance. This one isn't, um, but essentially they're doing the same thing. And, and what they're doing is recording GPS positions every 20 minutes, every night, um, for between one and three months. So we get an incredible amount of data from these owls that we wouldn't be able to get any other way. And essentially, wherever the owl goes, the GPS tracker goes with it. So including on private property, if we don't have access to it, the owl does. So um, it's attached to the two central tail feathers because um, uh, we need to catch the owl a second time to remove the tracker. But if we can't catch them back, if they're being stubborn, um, the, the tracker will drop off with the next tail mole. Whereas if you use a, a back mount harness, um, then it could stay on for the life of the owl. So generally the owls pull the trackers off anyway, and we, we most of the time we just pick them up off the ground um, or we catch them again to, to remove it. So at that point where, um, so the trackers programs, like we do a double check of everything, and then we're ready to release the owl um, back at the point of capture. And um, every week, um, a couple of times a week, I'll go out and check the, the health of the owl just to, to, just to make sure the tracker is sitting okay. If it's not, then we'll um, plan to go out and catch it and, and remove the device. So here's what, oh, I've gone all dark. Um, here's what I've found, here's what we've found um, so far. So over the, the four years, it's, it's really has been a, a combined collaborative effort to, to get to this stage. Um, so we've actually um, got data from 20 different owls around Melbourne and, and that has amounted to over 20,000 GPS points of, of where powerful owls have moved. Ultimately, what we end up with is, um, as I said, 30 to 40 can be up to three months um, of, of time sequence movement tracks per owl. So what I mean by that is the, because the tracker is automated, it's, it's recording a position, date, time, and there's a whole stack of other information as well. Um, so we can use that to um, work out some, uh, to find out some very interesting things. One of those things that we've um, looked at, and this was research that was taken on by um, one of our honours students, Nick Carter, back in 2018. Um, if, you, if you'd like to read more about this research, um, you can look up that publication there. It is open access. So we, what we wanted to work out was how are these owls moving in urban environments? Um, now, without getting too technical, there's a whole stack of information that goes into developing um, this sort of data. So if you're of the more technically minded, you can read the paper. Um, but basically what we found was that powerful owls in Melbourne, across all of the owls that we were looking at, they had three different types of movements that they were making. And they were uh, a prey handling movement, which are, are shorter movements. Now, from extensive observations that we've been making in the field, when they're holding prey, if they're holding something that's up to their own body weight and prey, they're not gonna be making big movements. So these are typically the shorter movements that we see. Um, now, that the second type of movement that they're making is a, a foraging movement where they um, might be exploring a little bit more, they might be surveying different areas and, um, and looking for suitable prey. And then the third type of movement is um, much longer and quicker movements, and we call them transitory movements. So they're, they're exploring the extent of their home range and um, Look, surveying, they might be doing territorial calls to nearby um, neighbouring owls and that sort of thing. So this will all um, become a bit clearer when I show you this video. 
um, the, the image that you can see here is um, kind of like a satellite image. It's um, the black and white areas uh, called NDVI and it's essentially a measure of greenness. So the darker areas are more treed or more green. The white and the lighter areas are reflecting light. So that's things like um, agriculture, impervious surfaces, housing, things like that. So they, this sort of area here that I'm uh, using with my pointer, that's all um, suburban housing. Uh, we've got some paddocks here, um, agriculture. And then in the green, uh, uh, EVC riparian vegetation. So um, I'll play the video now. And those three different movements are in the, the red, blue, and yellow. So this was um, movements made over 41 nights and the video is condensed down to about 10 seconds and what you can see um, is that the owl is making those shorter movements, prey handling and foraging movements generally in areas where it's high tree cover and riparian vegetation. It's got a real hot spot area here where there's a protected reserve and then when it's moving out from there, it's having to make these big jumps across agricultural areas where there's no tree cover. So um, in this fragmented landscape, they're, they're having to move quickly over to a more suitable area for them. They spend a lot of time over here. I think from memory, most of this area was privately owned land. So even, um, so even uh, privately owned land with good tree cover is really important for powerful owls. Um, yeah, I think that's, hopefully that um, is quite clear with the video there. It's quite neat to see how, how it was moving and sticking to certain areas. So now that we've got those time sequenced movement data, so it's where it's one point over to the next and to the next, um, we can develop these really accurate um, estimates of how much space the owls need. So um, re we refer to this as their home range. Um, and here's what we've found. So on average, um, the owls in Melbourne they need 638 hectares of space um, of their overall home range. And in the image down the bottom in the purple is um, the amount of space that the owl um, needs overall. Um, and then in the white areas is the core range. So. Um, that's the area, basically, if the owls don't have that core range, then they, they wouldn't be able to survive in these landscapes. Um, so this is another area where um, the owl is spending a significant amount of time foraging uh, and on private property. Um, people might also find this interesting because um, a, a, a home range, well, a home range of a powerful owl anyway, isn't like a, a, a circle. Um, it's kind of like a spider's web where they're using certain areas and moving through certain areas. And I think there's been a paper which suggests that powerful owls will opportunistically um, harvest um, prey in certain areas at different times of the year. So their home range will be dynamic. We've just captured this home range over a, a 30 night period, something like that, but it will change over time. Um, and on average, we've found that the owls um, will travel 4.6 kilometers in, in one night. Over to the right hand side um, are the different areas that we've uh, documented powerful owl home ranges. So right down to the Mornington Peninsula um, and then many, many uh, home ranges out around Manningham 
and a couple in the Yarra Ranges as well, and Nilambic too. Um, there are a few that we haven't put on, that I haven't put on, on here yet that we um, got in the last season. So all of this talk about 638 hectares, it doesn't really mean very much, like even to me, until we put it into context. So um, we're all, we all haven't really been getting our fix of the, the, the footy and of the MCG recently. So I'll put into context for you, essentially one powerful owl on average will need 360 MCGs to survive. And then the distance that they travel every night is about 10 laps of the MCG oval. So hopefully that makes it a bit clearer for you. And here's some more home ranges of um, different owls that we've studied. Um, essentially what we've found a, a very similar, um, very similar data. So the owls are uh, choosing to position their home range in areas of really high tree cover along river systems. Um, if it's not a reserve, it's a, it's a leafy suburb there, um, such as these sorts of ranges here. Um, and foraging out into people's private properties and things like that. Um, but uh, some differences that we do see is that in this top left image, you can see that this owl was foraging out into very high density um, residential areas. You can see that by the, the yellow dots. Um, so we've got uh, some, mo some movement into urban areas and even some movement into agricultural areas but sticking towards the trees um, lining the paddocks um, whereas over to the right hand side there's some owls that don't don't move into those urban areas at all um, and there's another clear clear line a clear um, barrier where the owl is not traveling down into suburban areas at all and we're very confident that there's no other owl in this area we've been doing this research as i said um, for 25 plus years so we've got a pretty good idea now of where the um, main powerful owl pairs are in melbourne Um, in this slide here, I just wanted to highlight, um, uh, I guess, the, the volume of data that we, we get from these GPS positions. And as I said, we wouldn't be able to get this information any other way. So each um, colour that you can see here is a different home range. Um, and all the little dots are individual GPS locations. Um, so essentially where that owl was at a particular point in time. Um, this, is, this is out along the, um, the Yarra River, extending out along the Yarra River into Manningham. We've got park orchards down here and Warrandyte. So we've spent a lot of time out in Warrandyte. Um, there are so many pairs and, and they really are um, butting up their, their home ranges very closely side by side. So um, here we can see that there is a little bit of movement crossing over into this, this owl's range. So the blue and the green do intersect. Same with the yellow and the green. Um, same with the yellow and the purple down here. There seems to be a a bit of an overlap here of um, home ranges there. Um, yeah, and so now that we have, um, now that we have an understanding of how much space the owls need, um, we can try and answer how much habitat is actually available to them in Melbourne. Um, sorry, I'm running a little bit behind time, so hopefully you can um, bear with me. So this was part of my honours research, um, and you can read more about it in this publication down here. And essentially, this is something that you can contribute to. If you see a powerful owl, you can submit it to an online repository such as Bird Data through BirdLife Australia, 
and you can contribute to this this sort of research so what i did was i gathered a whole stack of citizen science data and then i developed a model using um, different environmental layers so things like land use tree cover um, roads rivers so all of this sort of information can be combined to essentially produce a map that says where where areas are suitable and where areas are potentially unsuitable for powerful owls and so here's what we found um, in the pink areas the pink areas are highlighted as or um, as potentially suitable for the powerful owl. Um, we've got Melbourne um, here to the left, the Dandenong Creek and the Yarra River is flowing up through here. So you can see here um, the Yarra Ranges is out around this sort of area here. You can see that there's a lot of potential um, habitat for them. Um, they really like that high tree cover um, out around the Daniel Ranges and out through to the Yarra Valley. But then you do see these areas of grey which are highlighted as unsuitable for the owl. And they align with areas of um, agriculture, really high density urban areas. Um, and the black dots are the citizen science records that went into developing this model. So. These are the sightings of powerful owls, or the black dots, and you can help contribute to this sort of data set. Okay, I'm gonna have to move on. Um, so some of the more recent uh, research that I've been working on um, while we've been in lockdown, I've been at my computer working uh, very busily away. Um, I've been analysing where owls like to roost. So this diagram here is essentially showing the, the preference. So it's its most favourite tree species to roost in. And so we have our 20 owls down here. So each bar is a different owl. Um, so we can see here that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven owls that we've studied really liked to roost in Kunzia. Um, Ericoides or Bergen, it's gone through a couple of different name changes. Um, and what might be surprising to some of you is that these owls um, are roosting in non-Indigenous tree species. So we've got the non-Indigenous tree species to that area in uh, highlighted in red on the right hand side here. So things like radiata pine, English oak, sweet potosporums in purple, um, they absolutely love to roost in sweet potosporums. Um, things like desert ash and English elm as well. Um, these sorts of trees and, and willows, these sorts of trees provide really good shelter and shade over those um, spring and summer months. But a lot of those um, non-Indigenous tree species are deciduous. So they will be, um, shifting their roost at this time of year, kind of uh, uh, autumn to winter, they will shift their roost into something that is evergreen. So um, one more thing that I want to point out here, the numbers indicate the um, number of different tree species that that owl roosted in at that, during that time we had the GPS tracker on. So for this owl here, it was roosting about 30% of the time in English oak, about 30% of the time in swamp paper bark, but then it also had another seven different tree species that it was roosting in that I haven't um, filled out here. Whereas some others are roosting exclusively in pines or exclusively, almost exclusively in sweet potosphorus. So the owls are roosting in what is, um, available to them at that particular time and at that particular area. So what I'm trying to highlight here is that um, there is variation in the roosts that they use. And um, yeah, and they do seem to be, uh, there seems to be a fairly even split 
in where they roost in terms of the the height. So about half of roosts are found up in the canopy of the tree and then half are found in kind of mid-storey vegetation underneath that canopy. And when you're out um, looking at um, out looking for owls and um, out walking around and uh, keep in mind those those tree species in the back of your head that I just showed you because if you do see one go and have a look under it and see if you can find some of this evidence that I um, briefly touched on before so things like whitewash um, feathers and the pellets as well and if you find this evidence, it means that there's a really good chance that there's an owl that is regularly roosting there and it has been roosting there recently. So how can you help? So I, I said that one of the things that you can do to help is if you do see an owl, um, please don't share it to social media. Just be sensible about where you post things. Um, because we're talking about a threatened species here and we're trying to increase their numbers, not increase disturbance. So if you can share, um, if you can report sighting to something like bird data through BirdLife Australia, it's a very um, easy to use iPhone app. Um, there's information online about how to lodge sightings using bird data. Um, Otherwise, other things that you can be doing, um, so for these last three points, I'm gonna be channeling my inner Costa here. So um, please, you can help to, to control the spread of environmental weeds on your property. Um, you can speak to your local council if your property is just inundated with weeds. Speak to your local council about appropriate ways on how you can um, selectively remove particular trees while doing succession planting. So doing both at the same time so that if an owl is roosting in something like a sweet potosporum, then um, it will have something else to, to replace that, that um, critically important habitat component um, when, that, when that tree is removed. So don't be afraid to get out there. Um, go and plant some trees. The, the best time to plant a tree was yesterday. The second best time is now. So get out there, plant some, some of these um, uh, beautiful big uh, eucalypt trees and maintain those eucalypt trees as well. And here's a, an example of a a beautiful large old eucalypt in a suburban backyard in, in the east of Melbourne. But it's a, it's a very special tree because it's been left to mature and form hollows. And you might be able to see, depending on your video resolution, there is a pair of powerful owls right in the center there. And this pair of owls roost, uh, they nest in this um, tree on private property every single year. And this, uh, so as I was mentioned, mentioning before, there's really good um, understory vegetation in this image and for these owls as well, so that when the chicks do fledge, um, they've got something to land onto, onto so they don't end up on the ground. So while we are on the topic of um, hollows, I'm sorry I've gone a bit over here. Um, so, uh, there's been really limited uptake of powerful owls using nest boxes, um, full stop. There's been one record of powerful owls um, using a box and um, you can read about what happens and the, I think there's dimensions of, in, of the box um, in this publication here by Ed, Ed McNabb and Jim Greenwood. Jim Greenwood uh, designed and built the box, and uh, I think he still does build those, bo those sorts of boxes. Um, so there's, there's something that we probably aren't quite able to replicate in a traditional box that is present in a natural hollow. It might be something like humidity, temperature, um, the drainage. You've got to think about so many different things. Um, and some really exciting research that is coming out of the Uni of Melbourne um, with the PhD student Dan Parker is actually um, an architect student 
and they they really have pardon the pun they they really are thinking outside of the box here and they're using 3d printed um, blocks to put together these sorts of natural material um, hollows and they are much lighter than a than a, a salvaged hollow or a, a nest box and the idea is that these sorts of boxes will be um, prosthetic nests as they're called um, will be designed tailored for a particular site for a particular species and um, particular um, position in the tree as well. And they, the idea about these came about because um, powerful owls uh, do nest in termite mounds up around Sydney and Brisbane and uh, hollowed out termite mounds. So that's, that's where the kind of the concept has come from. And already has had sugar gliders, rosellas and galahs use um, those prosthetic nests. Um, he's also doing tests with salvaged carved hollows. Um, there's a few different ar arborist companies that are um, placing these up around Melbourne, such as Melbourne Tree Care. And um, they've had uh, possums and lorikeets use these site types of hollows. Um, now, nest boxes have been very successful um, with other species, but in this study, he hasn't recorded anything using a nest box yet. Um, so they're very, very light, those prosthetic nests. Um, they're very quick and easy to install. Um, and they, they mimic the, uh, from initial tests, they, they mim mimic the temperature and humidity of natural hollows very closely. Um, whereas some of these other types, um, they, they fluctuate more. So they have colder, um, colder and hotter temperatures. Um, so you can read about this research more in the conversation article. I was a co-author on this article. So log on to the conversation, have a look at that. Um, but there, don't get me wrong there, I think, Artificial hollows are, are fantastic, um, but there, there needs to be significantly more thought put into some of these very important ecological questions to ensure that your efforts um, are more effective. And probably the most important point here um, before I finish is that a 300 year old tree is not equivalent to an artificial hollow developed in days. We cannot justify the removal of some of these beautiful big old trees by substituting with artificial or quick fix structures um, nearby. So uh, with that, um, sorry that I've gone over. I um, just really wanted to thank um, Yo Rangers. Thanks Jen for organizing this today. Thank you everyone for logging on. Um, some other councils and um, people that have been critically important to um, having this research take part and, and helping fund the um, very expensive trackers as well. Um, so I'll leave it there. Um, if you'd like to stick around and ask a question, um, that's fine, that's great. I'll um, stay on for as long as I need to. Um, Looks like hopefully, Jen, you've been keeping tabs on the questions there. I saw that popping up. <laughs> yeah, it's been uh, it's been crazy. It's really gone off, it's, which is awesome. Uh, yeah. Really excited to see how many people have actually been loving this talk. Um, I'm just going to try and summarise a few of the questions. Yep. So, uh, one of them, we just had a basic wanting to know about uh, what they eat. Is there anything other than the possums? Do they eat any rabbits, uh, small cats and dogs, anything like that? Uh, yeah, so that hasn't been part of my research, but as I said, I think my my supervisor analysed about 3,000 pellets um, to, to look at what they've been eating. So um, basically, they'll, they'll usually um, eat arboreal prey, so that means prey that is up in the canopy of the tree. So they will, um, feral rabbits have been found in their diet, but it's rare. Um, things like 
flying foxes, gliders, birds, possums. That's the main stuff that um, power flowers will eat. Um, rarely you see baby koalas, um, brush-tailed turkeys. I, you, yeah, you hear of all sorts of things that they eat, but it's, it's often rare. Excellent. Um, and I just wanted to actually, well, I just wanted to do quickly while before we wrap up. I've still there's so many questions coming in, and I will get to them. But I just thought I'd just quickly do a quick poll just to see what everyone felt about today. So I'm just going to quickly launch this poll to find out what did you find most interesting about today's powerful talk. You put so much into this, Nick. There was so much information for everyone yeah. to take on, um, and I think it was absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much for all your time. But it's just no really nice to, to kind of see what everyone re really. Uh, sparked everyone's imagination today um, and I'm seeing that uh, we're getting a lot of people I'm just going to give a few more minutes for everyone to, to... so Jen Jen I've opened up the question I'm just going to I'm just going to start answering some of these pretty quickly go for it and I'm going to I've, right. I've got another one so once this one's done I will just uh, throw this another poll as well but keep go for the answers because there's a lot of questions out there <laughs> Thanks everyone for logging on. If you do need to go, um, completely understand. I've got some questions here though. Um, so there was a question about if there's uh, if there's been research in the west side of Melbourne. Um, so they really need that tree cover. Um, so we've mostly focused our efforts in the east of Melbourne, but um, towards the west, it's mostly grasslands or urban housing, unfortunately. Um, but I think there are some pairs around the uh, Brisbane Ranges and that sort of area. So there are some out to the west, and even if you go out towards Box Iron Bark country around um, uh, Bendigo, Ballarat, there are some out there as well. I'm just going to quickly do another poll just to see what everyone actions are now going to take after this webinar. So uh, if I can get whoever's left, or oh, I've still got over nearly 300 people still here. So please uh, answer this one as well. But what actions you're going to take now following this webinar and everything that Nick's been talking about today um, and all the excellent ideas he's had, I think it, it'd be really lovely just to see if people are going to take that on. Um, just so you know, the majority of people, 41%, really loved uh, learning about the travel and where they fly to and what their home range is, uh, the owls. I think it's a very interesting, I think it's more, much more than I think most of us expect. So <laughs> it's uh, lovely to sort of see that. Anyway, I'll let you get to another question while we're getting these poll results in. We had a trouble about um, spotlighting, actually, and whether or not spotlighting the, uh, the bright lights was going to upset or affect the owls. I didn't know if you wanted to talk to that for a second. Yep. Um, so what is advised and what we do is we really minimise the amount of um, light that we shine onto the owl. So either covering the torch just with your hands and um, just showing a little bit of light through your fingers can be effective. Otherwise, you can buy um, red filters for certain spotlights online, um, and they can be quite good as well. So I've got a I've got a um, a good um, spotlight head torch, but I can also swap it over to um, uh, a red red filter light as well. Um, uh, We've got sharing those results, and it's just really lovely to see that people are really keen to tell others about what they've learned today at 60% and 72% are going to start looking for powerful owl signs in the area as well and protecting the trees in their garden at 36% of the people watching today. So that's really lovely too. So thank Absolutely. you very much everyone. Um, we're still going to try and power, there's 50 questions here Nick. <laughs> so we'll try and get through a few of them. Obviously we're not going to get to everyone. There will be an email being sent out to all of you in a couple of days time. If uh, Nick hasn't got to your questions today, uh, do please contact me and I'll see if I can kind of annoy Nick for the rest of the week by sending him <laughs> questions. Otherwise, I would definitely have a look at some of those uh, researches, uh, research papers that Nick uh, suggested and then maybe have a little look and see if there's any other questions, uh, your answers to your questions in those. But Nick, let's have just another quick look at some of these questions. Still um, so where are powerful owls likely to nest in their home range? So, um, so they generally, it can differ, but um, generally what we've found is that they will have a central core 
And within that central core, that will be the area that they roost and where most of the time where their nest is going to be as well. So then they will forage out from that point. So you saw a few diagrams there where they do these kind of exploratory movements out from that central point um, and heading out and around. There's another question about if the tree was a eucalyptus viminalis. Um, I can't remember which photo it was, but I have recorded them both roosting and nesting in viminalis. Um, I think that was in that beautiful picture you showed, Nick, of uh, the large canopy and all the different uh, native trees and different uh, vegetation around with that, so two. Oh, that one. Um, yeah, I think so. It had the white bark like a, a viminalis, so yeah. Um, uh, have chainsaw hollows been in existing trees been looked into? Yes, they have. Even in, in trees like um, pines and things like that. Um, you just need to find a, a, a responsible arborist that, that knows how to do that without killing the tree. Um, and um, Melbourne Tree Care is one of those group of uh, arborist companies that there, there are a few others so apologies if anyone else is listening that knows others um i just want to show you actually what? if you're able to um i can show people how they can check out what uh, native plants if they're in the air ranges oh yes show yep. people how to go onto the air rangers council's website and show so you can see what are your best uh ways to look at native plants in your area so i shall just share that so if you go onto our council website here uh yarrangers.vic.gov.au and then you click down on click on the environment section if you scroll down the website there's a section here called online maps and if you click on that that'll take you to our intro maps just click accept on that and then what you can do, when, it takes a little bit of time, and this is very dependent on how good your internet is, I have to say, and if there's a lot of people watching Netflix in your house, it'll be much, much slower. <laughs> but uh, you, can either, you can either put in your, part, your actual address or you can kind of find it here on the map. And I'll just, uh, like I said, it gets very slow. But if you click on a section here, then what happens, this little window pops up at the side. You can scroll all the way down and you can see this bit says vegetation community. And if you scroll all the way down, you can see uh, you can see the ecological vegetation class here, and that's a, a Managam riparian forest. So we're in the kind of Healesville area. And if you want to actually look, you can click on the full uh, species list here. And so if you wanted to plant uh, in your garden uh, an indigenous plant that would have grown there naturally, this is the list you can take, and you can have a look through this. You can go to any of our local community nurseries, indigenous nurseries, so there's a few all around. Uh, there's some yelling bows in the southern Dandenongs, in the uh, Candlebark nursery as well, so have a little look on this and then you can see this great list and you can pretty much pick, it's got upper story, middle story, um, all sorts. So yeah, you can pretty much go to your nursery and ask them for any of these, uh, which is great and it's a really good way of, as Nick was saying, if you have to take down any weed trees, uh, before you do that, you can plant a few of these, give it a few years, and then you can remove your weed trees um, and still be able to keep uh, your uh, cover for your uh, native animals and possums and owls and all sorts of creatures. So that's a really, really useful technique. Right, um, some of the questions we had uh, were, there were so many. Do you know, I think you've kind of answered that one about similar research in any other areas, and I don't think there was a few questions about wanting to know specifically where your studies were completed but i know you're you're kind of reluctant to tell people the exact sites aren't you in case people decide to go out studying yeah yourself. well it really is a, a a broad area around greater melbourne um so pretty much right along the yarra river up to past warrandite that's the area we've focused a lot of our attention because there is a urbanization gradient along there as well so you get out to the more urban fringe areas around Croydon, um, Wonga Park, uh, that sort of area. And then you get out to the, the forested areas as well. So, but then, yeah, in, in uh, last year, I documented a few along the Mornington Peninsula too, so, yeah. Now, there was a few questions as well about how many owls there actually are, maybe in the Downham Ranges or in the Yarra, Yarra Ranges. Do you know any specific numbers? 
Um, not in the Dandenong Ranges. We actually, we haven't really um, looked at the Dandenong Ranges very closely because the, the, the canopy of the trees there is so tall. Um, we just really struggle to get the net up that high. And essentially with the net, we're trying to cover off the top of the canopy. So um, in most of our sites, we can get the net up um, 20, 25 metres tall. Um, high, but um, in the Dandenongs, the, the trees there are just way too tall. So, but in terms of approximate numbers, probably between 20 to 30 breeding pairs in Greater Melbourne um, is what I tell people. Um, yeah, there's probably more owls, what we call floater owls, that are kind of trying to find their own territory and they pop up every now and then. Um, in people's backyards and things like that. So there's not many at all then, really, just 30 breeding pairs. So we've really got to look after them, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it also comes down to the habitat as well. So around um, Sydney, I think there's upwards of over 100 breeding pairs in Sydney, uh, in Greater Sydney, but they have really good habitat. There's lots of channels and, and streams in Sydney. Um, whereas in Melbourne, we, we really only have the Yarra River and um, uh, various ephemeral creeks and things as well. And we've got a couple of other questions about kind of uh, the family setup, I guess, of uh, powerful owls. So questions about do the powerful owls mate for life? And also how long do the chicks stay with their parents? Uh, what's the incubation period? Is there a point where the parents just literally kick their, ch their chicks out? Uh, and what's that kind of uh, yeah, the family setup like? Yeah, so um, the, the chicks will usually be kicked out of their natal territory around March, April. So that's when temperatures start to change and the adults of that pair will start to be thinking about nesting again. Um, as for what happens with those chicks, we really don't know. Um, earlier this year, I went out to a site um, and I expected to see two owls. I ended up seeing five within a few hundred metres. So that makes me think that um, powerful owl young will stick around maybe on the periphery of the adults' range for a number of years before they actually start to make a big dispersal movement and find their own territory. Um, they will mate for life, but um, if one owl does uh, pass away, um, I believe they do, um, they will take on another, um, another of the pair. Um, We've got a, a number of people actually uh, wanting you to come out and look on their site, look on their land, <laughs> do some studies on their land. So I don't know uh, if, if people have uh, that sort of request, is it best to email you or what's the um, yeah, we haven't really had that before. Um, the best thing that you can be doing, if you do have, if you know you've got powerful owls, um, submitting records to a responsible um, database such as the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas or Bird Data, and that way your records are protected and private, um, and and they will still be contributing to, to ecological research as well. And then we also, um, oh, sorry, that, go. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe just email me um, and I'll have a think about it. Yeah. Because there's potential for like other research projects on bushland properties through Deakin and other universities as well. So I'll have a think about it. And on that, some people have questions about the trackers that you yep. put on the owl. So how much do they weigh and how long do they typically stay on the owl? I know that you said that they will molt off, but how long does that sort of take if you haven't been able to catch them? Um, well, it's, it'll be within a year. Um, their, their tail molt, it, it seems to be quite sporadic. So sometimes we'll put a track, like this year I put some trackers on owls and then five days later the tracker was on the ground. So if they really don't want it on them, they'll just pull it off themselves. Um, they, they're they very lightweight. Um, I think uh, the older style was up to 30 grams. And then this one is, 
I can't remember, 20 to 30 grams. So they're very lightweight. Um, the owls, you see them preening the antenna into their tail feathers. So it really doesn't, they, they couldn't be phased. <laughs> Now we have, before people all leave, we have had some uh, requests for this video. So this video is being recorded and we are going to upload this to the council website and to the council YouTube. It'll give us a couple of weeks because we might need to edit it down a little bit and just uh, check that we're not giving it any privacy issues or anything like that. So we'll just need to edit it, but do have a look on the uh, Yarra Rangers website and the YouTube channel um, for that. And also don't forget, we've obviously got these other webinars coming up. There'll be links to those in the email that you'll be getting in a couple of days. So please do check out those. We're still, I mean, we've still got 200 people next to so if you're happy to stay around for five more minutes yep. or so. Um, some people yep. have asked me about the chainsaw hollows and have those been looked into? Because you mentioned a few of the different uh, hollow options. Um, yep. What have you thought about chainsaw hollows? Yeah, I, I did um, get to that question, Jen. So oh, sorry, I'm mm. just scrolling through so many. <laughs> That's all right. There's one question from Monica. What, um, what type of scientist am I? And, what am I studying? So, so I'm, I, I would define myself as an ecologist, um, and that is the study of um, native plants uh, and animals and their interaction with their environment. So um, I'm using the, I mean, I love the powerful owls, but um, in more general, I'm, I'm a, an ecologist. Um, and then we have some, do, what does a water resource do, but do the owls need, do they fly down to the um, yeah, good question. They they don't actually drink per se. Like I, I think in summer they might go down. I've never seen one drinking. Um, they get all of their their um, water and fluids from the prey that they eat. Um, and there there was a paper that documented and had some photos of a powerful owl bathing in a stream. So water is critically important for them, not only for the vegetation that they like, but um, during those summer months, they, they will like to um, roost in areas very close to the water um, so they can, they can cool off. It's a much cooler um, spot to, to roost in. And that actually leads us on to another question here from Carol about uh, does their home range vary depending on factors such as time of year breeding season and also have you seen any change in the range with the climate conditions and sort of you know with temperatures getting hotter but as, a, as it's getting uh, warmer in the south? Yeah um, another good question we haven't really been able to look at things like that because the project with um, the GPS trackers. It's been running for four years, but it's not really enough data to be able to comment on whether um, home ranges are shifting due to climate change. Um, they, the, the home ranges definitely shift over the year though. And again, we haven't really been able to document that um, because we, we need to step back. So when the, when the owls are nesting at this time of year, we need to let them do their own thing. Um, so we haven't really been able to document breeding season home range, but I would suspect, and um, some of the literature suggests that they have a, a more refined home range when they're breeding, but when they're um, feeding chicks and things like that, they will, use a much larger space. That's cool. I've got someone here, um, uh, Elizabeth wants to know what's the best organisation to join to help uh, to protect habitat. And I, I'd like to talk to that one because I'm yeah, sure. with the environmental volunteers at Yarra Rangers Council, as well as community engagement. So uh, join an environmental volunteer group near you. Uh, they're always uh, protecting, they're weeding, they're planting trees. Um, have a look, feel free to contact me. I can put you in if you're a Yarra Rangers uh, resident, I can put you in touch with your local group, but definitely look out for land care groups, look out for uh, friends groups and things like that. So definitely have a talk and have a little bit of a Google what's on Facebook and what's around you. And even the Gardens for Wildlife programs that Yarra Rangers Council and a number of other councils run as well is really good because they'll help you uh, establish plant, native plants in your garden. If you have a larger property, we actually have the Ribbons of Green project as well. So that's uh, for really large hectare properties. So uh, yeah, there's lots of opportunities at council for us to kind of help you 
revegetate some areas or join a group that's doing that sort of stuff as well. Um, so that's, that's my little plug. I'm yeah. seeing some people are saying they, they're finding little um, things on the ground that they're not sure if they are uh, from powerful owls or not. They're finding uh, sort of innards and intestines. They don't know if they're finding bits of possums. Is it likely to be a powerful owl or is it likely to be a fox? Um, yeah, it's, it's difficult to say. Um, I do get emails quite frequently with pictures of gory innards and things like that. Um, I mean, it could be. I've, I've seen powerful owls um, because they only, they're carnivores, they only eat meat. So um, they won't eat the innards of a possum because there's um, plant matter in that, in, inside as well. So they'll rip all of that out and they'll only eat the meat part. Um, so yes, it could be, um, but yeah, it's, it's difficult to say. You're better off trying to look for evidence under those roosts um, in those trees that you saw earlier. Cool. Um, someone else just asked a very simple question. How long do they live? Um, I think there was one in captivity in Sydney was uh, up to 30 years old. So they are very long lived birds. Um, they invest a lot into their young. Um, they, they might only produce one offspring a year, if that. Um, so uh, yeah, long lived birds. And a couple more, I'm just gonna do two more questions because otherwise we could be here for days. Um, yeah. Someone asked, asked really early on actually, are the, the powerful owl eggs uh, predated by possums or anything like that? Um, again, I'm not too sure. Um, yeah, there was that research that came out of um, uh, down on Bruny Island with the swift parrots and the sugar gliders were eating the eggs of the, the swift parrots. Um, it's possible, um, but I would suspect the owls would protect their eggs very closely. Um, when, when the female is sitting on the eggs, she will, uh, she'll go out and, and still stretch, but she'll stay very close by. She'll keep an eye on the hollow. Um, so I suspect um, that if, if a possum did try to go in, it'd get a bit of a fright. <laughs> And then um, I think this last question kind of sums up a lot of the things you've been talking about, but they just wanted, um, Anne, Anne here wanted to know, do you have any information on, or thoughts on how fragmentation, fragmentation might be affecting powerful owls finding mates? And I think you've sort of touched on the importance of trees and old trees in our gardens. So mm. yeah, does, it, does that affect them being able to find a mate for life? Yeah, absolutely. Um, particularly if you go back to that um, suitability model that I showed before, you can see that there's fragmented patches of potentially suitable habitat right across Melbourne. But what they really need is are those connections in between um, to be able to move through. It, it, it really is um, up to us as individuals to, to get out there and help to fill in some of those gaps. And those gaps are on private property. So um, that's your job for this weekend. Get out there and, and get growing. <laughs> it's the perfect time of year to get out there and plant trees as well. Yeah. <laughs> and I did say it was last question, but I just thrown in, there's a couple, one more, which kind of sums up to you. Um, people are wanting to know what the best apps are to either identify our species or things like iNaturalist. What are your thoughts? What can people download right now and just go outside for a walk, really? Yeah. Um, so there's, there's a number of different apps that you can be using and I'm recommending you use um, bird data through BirdLife Australia um, because that will contribute to um, uh, the BirdLife, uh, the Atlas data through BirdLife. Um, iNaturalist can be good if you don't know what a species is. So even things like fungi and plants, um, definitely download that app to, and, and birds upload a photo, but um, with bird data, you don't need a photo. Um, so uh, that can be good if you're, if you're very confident that it's a powerful owl that you've seen, you can open up bird data, record the sighting. iNaturalist, you need a photo. Um, VBA Go, you do need a photo for that as well. Again, if you're seeing a nocturnal owl, it can be very difficult. Um, and then with eBird, it's, it's eBird's more so for checklists of, 
um, for bird watchers. Um, and the problem with eBird is that it's it's very um, like they, they don't have very good um, protocols around dealing with threatened species data. So we're talking about a threatened species here and, and people do use eBird and, and report sightings of powerful owls on it, but it's probably not the best um, way and the best reporting app. Otherwise for how to ID, um, iNaturalist can be good to help you ID something. Um, I've got the Michael Morcombe Bird Field Guide app on my phone, it's excellent. It's got um, all, pretty much all of the bird calls along with it. There's a Simpson and Day app as well. Otherwise, if you're wanting a free app, um, you can use the Museums Victoria app. And I think there's one out of Cornell, Cornell University, Cornell Lab, um, that can be quite good as well. So. Excellent. Okay, well, I think we should probably wrap it up here. There are still a bunch of questions. I'm so sorry we didn't get to everyone, but obviously we've gone half an hour over. It just sort of shows the passion and the yeah, absolutely. And these beautiful animals. So thank you so much, Nick. And thank you to everyone Thanks, who joined us today. Um, yeah, it's been wonderful. So I think, I think for our take home today is just make sure we're planting more trees and not taking down too many before we've got some replacements for them. Yeah, um, and yes, yeah, so thank you. I'm so sorry. I've seen people are raising their hands. I'm so sorry. I think we're going to have to wrap it up. We could be here all day and uh, we'll <laughs> back another time, Nick, because clearly yeah. this is a very popular topic. Maybe we'll just do an hour session with just quick Q&A and people can Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Okay, thanks very much everyone for tuning in and thanks Jen for organising. Yeah, thank you everyone and make sure you tune in for our uh, future webinars, Lyrebirds, uh, Climate Change, we'll have uh, wombats and quitting plastics and lead possums coming up later this year as well. So anyway, I will let everyone go and enjoy the rest of their rainy Saturday. <laughs> All right, have a great day. Bye guys. Bye.